Hi everyone, I'm Kelly, office manager here at Grace Church. We have a few announcements for you this week. Bruce Harvest is in need of canned vegetables. If you have any, feel free to drop them off in the lobby. Next Saturday, February 20th, is our blood drive. We are in need of volunteers. If you are able to help, please contact the church office or Belinda Maxwell. Next Wednesday, we will be having our Ash Wednesday service. We will be live streaming and in person. Pastor Todd will be offering the church to receive ashes outside of the Ash Wednesday service from 9 a.m. until 12 p.m. on the morning of the 17th. Ashes will be given with social distancing safeties. Finally, the story of reality will be a Bible study held by Brian Jenkins beginning March 1st. If you're interested, please contact the church office or Brian Jenkins directly. Thanks and have a great day. Good morning, church. All blessings to you from Jesus Christ, our saving Lord and King, the beginning and the end of all that is, who is, and who was, who is to come. His peace and grace be always with you. Amen. Would you join me? Well, I guess I have a couple of uh, uh, things I want to make sure that you're aware of this morning. That is, I wanted to explain a little bit about Ash Wednesday. I uh, had a lot of questions about, say, hey, pastor, how do you do Ash Wednesday? And you're talking about social distancing and, and keeping people healthy and safe. And I'm like, oh, I'm so glad you've asked that question. So what I'm going to be doing, and if you are watching it online and you're streaming it at home, uh, this is for you as well. The Ash Wednesday service is going to be live streamed. Uh, it's Wednesday at 7 o'clock, but it's also what we're doing is we're going to do an imposition of ashes, but it's going to be a little bit different. What I'm doing is I'm going to take Q-tips. I'm going to pre-dip them in ash and oil. 
uh, and put them in little snack baggies uh, and tape them to the inside. And what I'll do is I'll hand those out at the beginning of service. And when it comes time for imposition, um, you or your family members or a close group of you, or you can take it upon yourself uh, to impose the ashes uh, uh, on your on your head. Uh, that's the best way. It's not the ideal way, but it's the best way that I can think of of doing it and, and making sure that everybody's uh, in a good place. So that's kind of what we're doing. If you're not comfortable coming to service, I'm going to have the same rules apply on, uh, so on Wednesday morning here at the church in the lobby. Wednesday from 9 to noon, uh, I'll be available to impose ashes as well. So it's my hope, my prayer to be able to uh, help us through this wonderful, this time of, especially with this holy time as we begin the season of Lent. I can't believe it's Lent already. Wow. Where did time go, guys? I could have sworn Lent was last year. Wasn't it? So, <laughs> so some of you guys are thinking, oh, wait, wait. <laughs> anyway, would you, I would invite you to rise and join me in our opening call to worship. Because of God's great strength and mighty power, not one is missing. Why do you say, Jacob, and declare, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My God ignores my predicament. Look up at the sky and consider who created these? The one who brings out all their attendants by one, summoning each of them by name. Don't you know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow tired or weary. His understanding is beyond all human reach, giving power to the tired and reviving the exhausted. Youths will become tired and weary. Young men will certainly stumble. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will fly up on wings like eagles. They will run and not be tired. They will walk and not grow weary. Would you continue to join me in our opening Psalter reading? God commands an eternal covenant and sends redemption, redemption to earth. Great are the works of the Lord, which abound to the ends of the earth. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart and the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who have pleasure in them. Full of honor and majesty are the works of the Lord, whose righteousness endures forever. Who has caused his wonderful works to be remembered? The Lord is gracious and merciful. The Lord provides food for the faithful and is ever mindful of his covenant. The Lord has shown his people the power of his works by giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of the Lord's hands are faithful and just. The precepts of the Lord are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. The Lord sent redemption to his people and has commanded his covenant forever Holy and wondrous is God's name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. The praise of the Lord endures forever. Let us pray. God in heaven, who made the universe, who conquered chaos and brought forth order, who brought forth life out of lifelessness, who rescued the captive, set free the oppressed, and brought salvation, hear us this day. You have given us your law, and you have shared with us your beloved community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we may have life and live into your law to become your beloved community, both with you and one another. Open our hearts minds, eyes, ears, and hands, that we proclaim you as the everlasting God who defines all knowledge and life. Amen. Would you join me in our opening hymn? Christ 
the victorious. Give to your servants rest with your saints in the regions of light. Grief and pain ended and sighing no dust and to dust shall return yet at the grave shall we raise up our glad song saints in the regions of light. Grief and pain ended and sighing no longer, there may they find ever Please be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant with me, even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. No, this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my instructions within them and engrave them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. They will will no longer need to teach teach each other to say, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. And from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. This time, I'd like to introduce our special music this morning. We have uh, the Kuntz and Forrest family performing a quartet for us, I believe, right? All right. Everlasting 
treat. Thank you guys. That was wonderful. That was wonderful. One of the things about that COVID has forced us to do is really be innovative and some of the jewels that, uh, that we have been able to bring up forward because of this has been fantastic. So thank you. Thank you, Larry, for this fantastic work. It's, it's truly wonderful. Okay. As we take time to a time of offering our joys and our concerns, it's important that we know that we are praying uh, not just for our local concerns, our own personal concerns, but there are things in the world, there are strangers, there are the poor, the homeless, the helpless, the in trouble, the afflicted, uh, so much more. So as, as we are always cultivating a prayer life. Um, I want you to do a prayer audit the next time you're praying and ask yourself, am I praying for something, for the things that are beyond me, beyond my local connections? Uh, and, and how can I pray for, for, for the greater world around me? And remember that you are a part of something greater. It's, the world is so much bigger than I think than our insular circles. And... We always need to be aware of that, that God's grace is for the world, uh, not just for our own personal uh, wants and needs and desires. So as we're looking at our list of uh, joys and concerns this morning, I have um, one joy on my list. And what's Pastor Tool, Todd's rule about joys? We are to share our joys so easy to go to God with our problems, but let's look to our problems through the lens of our praises because that is really what the, what, the, what the strength of our faith is, that even in the midst of struggle, there is joy. So I'm going to let you off with a warning this week. And I hopefully that you'll be sharing more joys with me next week. Our joy is, uh, Aura has shared that Mike Heckman is doing much better. He's getting stronger each and every day. Uh, he has the nurses coming to visit him, and he's doing all that he needs to do. And God is still answering their prayers. 
We're praying for continued prayers of, of joy and thanksgiving for Amanda Myers and Andy and uh, welcoming their twins into the world this past week. Um, we are praising God with them. Do we have the same pictures to show, Dwayne, or was that just to the 745 service? I'm going to put Dwayne on the spot here. Dwayne's got pictures, and I know you ladies love pictures of babies. So uh, I don't know any of the, any of the uh, specifics uh, but uh, we're truly, truly blessed. Uh, Amanda was with, here with her family this morning. Uh, the kids are still in the NICU. Uh, they have to meet some parameters, some pretty heavy parameters, to be honest with you, uh, with, uh, with those. But, um, oh, there we go. Thanks, Dwayne. I put Dwayne on the spot there. He's so flexible. Oh, it's, uh, it's a fantastic thing. So as uh, their children are, are healthy, they're doing well, they have uh, some parameters to meet as far as gaining weight and breathing and they need to have a car seat test uh, so it might be a little bit till they're able to come home but uh, it's a fantastic fantastic opportunity so here I think this is the first one yeah there we go this is Lucas Andrew everybody go ooh everybody go aww <laughs> and then I think is Sarah it will be the next one we have coming forward. So we're praising God for their new family. We're praising God for all that he's doing in this family's lives. Uh, even in the midst of this uh, emphasis on mortality, it's always wonderful to welcome new life. So that's Lucas Andrew, and it should be Sarah. Yeah, this is Sarah Grace. So, <laughs> so I'm sure Amanda would love to hear uh, that you're praying for her and holding her and her family in prayer as they're spending a great deal of time at the hospital. So thank you, Dwayne, for that. I appreciate that. I know I put you on the spot. We're praying for Henry O'Brien, who had surgery yesterday at Hershey. Uh, we're praying for Lavelle, Lo Lo Lavelle Lovell. I always have a hard time rolling that one off the tongue. So <laughs> uh, she fell a few days ago and broke her, or a few weeks ago and broke her pelvis, uh, continued prayers for her healing. Um, I actually have an update. I was texting Reen Davidson between services this morning, and I want to share with you, uh, Reen thanks us for our continued prayers. Um, she has just been moved to critical care. Uh, so we are, we, are, we are praying for her, uh, and we are letting her know. Uh, she's actually, I think she's watching us right now, so uh, we're letting her know that our prayers, our hearts are with you. And uh, we're hoping and praying for, for God's grace to pour out over you. So, so I just uh, wanted to make sure she got that message. Uh, that's one blessing about live worship. <laughs> so we are praying for Reen. Uh, we're also praying because she just, uh, like I said, she just lost her husband last week uh, because of COVID. And she's in, she wasn't able to be at the funeral uh, because of being hospitalized as well. So... Uh, a lot of grief there, folks. A lot of grief, and she needs our prayers. She needs our prayers. Uh, continue prayers for Richard Mullenix. He's been uh, taken back to the hospital. Uh, this time, it's not a respiratory issue, but uh, it's uh, something different. Uh, but prayer for healing and comfort. Uh, prayers for the family and friends of Susan Landon. Susan passed away. Uh, this uh, was a lifelong friend of uh, Shirley Yingling uh, and uh, has left a really great hole. Uh, in her life. So those are our prayers and praises this morning. Would you join me in prayer? Holy and gracious Lord. God, you are good. You are loving. You are merciful. God, you are involved in our lives. You intimately care about each of our needs. We praise you, God, because you want a relationship. You desire a connection. When we could be left alone, left in isolation or separation, you've chosen to share with us, to share in this world, share in this creation, and to be invested in our lives. You are a God that cares. We thank you and we praise you. We trust you. We trust you, God, that you have our good in mind. That you have our 
lives in your hand. And Lord, we know, we know that you are involved intimately in every aspect of our being. You are present with us, walking beside us. And we praise you. We praise you, God, for the gift of new life. We praise you for answered prayers. We praise you, God, for the way of which you have worked in us, around us, through us, to transform the world. We praise you, God, because you have brought us light and call us to bring forth light, to offer grace and mercy so that we can offer grace and mercy, to bring love and forgiveness that we may have love and forgiveness. It's a special, special relationship. God, we ask that you would be with all of those lifted here this morning. God, you know them. You know their names. You know their needs. And God, you have a plan for each of them. And God, sometimes we frustrate your plans by doing what we want instead of listening to what you're calling us to do. But you've never abandoned us. You never walk away from us. Because you are faithful and true. We praise you, God. And we lift these persons this morning to your feet. Lord, that they may experience your love in a real way. Pour out over them. Shine your glorious light upon them. Lord, we pray for healing and strength and courage. We pray, God, for health and vitality. We pray, God, for peace and comfort. We pray, Lord, for your glorious will, your glorious work to be gloriously revealed. Lord, we pray for our church, the church universal around the world. We pray for our United Methodist Church. We pray for Grace Church. We pray for its strength and vitality. We pray for its mission and service in the world. We pray, God, that we may be that light, that city on a hill, that we may be salt. Strengthen our leadership. Raise up disciples. And help us, God, to be faithfully living out the work you've called us to each and every day. That we may be a people who walks in the way that leads to life. Pour out your Holy Spirit in this place. Permeate our hearts. Stir it up, stir up in us a passion and desire to serve you, to be your people, to keep your covenant. We pray, God, for our world leaders. We pray for our military personnel and their families at home and abroad. We pray for our police, our firefighters, our EMTs. We pray for all of those who are caring for others. We pray for families and their strength. And we pray for passionate faith. We pray all these things as we pray the prayer that you taught each of us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give to us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we recognize our offering this morning. As again, we will not be passing the offering plate.
Uh, it's uh, my hope and my prayer that you're, if you're able to give, if you are uh, feeling called to give, that you give uh, in the box that's in the hallway there before you enter the sanctuary. Uh, if you're not here in the building with us, or even if you are here in the building with us, you can give uh, through the app. Go under giving, uh, and it'll walk you through the steps. We have all of our accounts available for you to donate to the general fund, the building fund, our uh, capital fund, and uh, also, uh, of course, our missional budget as well. And uh, so that is a safe, secure way of giving. We are called as people of God, as children of God, to, to be a people who gives. To give not out of compulsion, not out of guilt, but to give out of reciprocity for what we have been given. We give because God has given to us. We give because we have received grace. We give as a call to discipleship, as a testimony to God's faithfulness. How we give reflects deeply our relationships. So my hope and my prayer is that you continue to give to support the ministries of our church. We are doing great work in our community and bringing relief. Uh, And then the church also tithes. We spend a tenth of our budget for missional work. That's That's a... a value, a virtue that I didn't bring to you when I came in July. That was you who you were long before I ever got here. And it's just so important. It's so wonderful uh, that we make sure that we're giving it so extravagant, extravagantly uh, in our call to ministry. We give not only in missions, but we give in many other different ways as your church uh, to bring mercy and relief and compassion and to faithfully supports uh, be what it means to be the church and to help build people up and bring relief. So thank you for that. I pray that you would join me as we sing the doxology together, as we celebrate this time of giving in worship. standing, if you are able, as we read the gospel lesson this morning. The gospel lesson comes from John's gospel, chapter 1, verses 9 to 13. And what we have here in this text is a little bit of repetition as to what John has opened the gospel with, with the first four verses. But here it's, it's identifying the true dynamic nature of who Jesus is and what Jesus has come to accomplish The true light that shines on all people was coming into the world. The light was in the world, and the world came into being through the light. But the world didn't recognize the light. The light came to his own people, and his own people did not welcome him. But those who did welcome him, those who believed in his name, he authorized to become God's children. Born not from blood, nor from human desire or passion, but born from God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you pray with me? Holy and gracious Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Pour out your spirit into this place. Open our minds, open our hearts to hear your word and to receive it. And give us, God, the courage to apply it in our lives, that we may be changed, that the world may be transformed, and that your kingdom reign on earth. Amen. Please be seated. See if I could do this without knocking anything over. (laughs) <laughs> talented that's right I could be an untangler type individual if preaching never doesn't ever work out for me <laughs> so this morning we are 
still, we're in week five of our belief series. We're going back to Christian fundamentals. What does it mean when I say I am a Christian? For us, being a Christian is not an association, but it's in a way of living, right? It's a very specific way of living. It tells you when I say that I am a Christian, that means I believe a very particular set of beliefs, and then I live out those beliefs in a very particular way. I am a Christian. I am a Christian. We're reclaiming the name, reclaiming the name. So today, we're talking about identity, Identity is a huge word uh, that maybe sometimes we, we don't think about that much or maybe we overthink it. But maybe identity could be something more specific and much greater than we could ever imagine. Now, when I was thinking about identity and what is our identity in Christ, it got me thinking about uh, the little name tags that you get on at a conference or at some sort of public event that says, hello, my name is, right? And you fill in the blank and it, and it helps people not have to ask that awkward question of, well, what's your name? Which I have to admit is even more awkward, right? Whenever someone has their name written on here and you look at it, you read it, and then you pronounce it wrong, Right? Instead of letting them tell you their name, we're trying to force our interpretation of their name, right? So if you have a, a normal name like Todd, for instance, it's hard to uh, mispronounce my name. I have a sister. My sister uh, always calls me too odd uh, as a, a way of, of just fun love. And, but, so, but my name is normally not very hard to uh, mispronounce. I realize that does qualify my character, but uh, that's a whole different story. I was weird before she gave me that name. So... With that, with that, the, uh, the big portion of it is, is, you know, you can mispronounce the name, but ultimately it's a label, right? This is, my name is, hello, my name is. Now, each of us probably puts our name there, but what if I asked you who you were? Who are you? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Most people, when I sit down and, and ask this question, they begin with something very, very specific. They begin li listing off a, a uh, role of relationships and achievements. Relationships and achievements. Here is who I know, and here is what I have done. When I was in undergraduate school, I uh, did a, a social science experiment uh, in a class, which I did in a study of a, of a subculture. It was an ethnographic research paper. And believe me when I tell you, it was just as boring as it sounds. But what it was was a study of subcultures. So it was a study of, of identity, of why people gather, uh, about why people do uh, the weird things that they do in small groups. But people come together because of a common set of beliefs or ideas or have a common set of characteristics, uh, and that causes people to gather. So we have labels that we've placed on ourselves, but also we have labels that society has given us, right? We have labels that society ha has given us. I, I think about the 1985 movie, uh, The Breakfast Club. Anybody watch The Breakfast Club at home? Put a hand up there, right? The Breakfast Club, uh, this group of kids on a Saturday morning are doing detention in school. Uh, I never had to worry about doing detention on a Saturday morning. Um, that's not to say I never had to worry about doing detention, but Saturday morning detention was still something that whenever I was in school, but I never had to worry about that. But this, this group of kids was in detention, and the, the principal or Mr. V, uh, the, the, the person in charge of overseeing them uh, only identified them by their labels, by their labels. One was the brain. One was the jock. I guess be the athlete. One was the princess, and one was the criminal, right? I had those right? Yes. Uh, there's another one. There was a weirdo, too. Was that me? Oh. <laughs> the basket case is the other one, right? That's it, right? So with this, with this, they begin to be known by their labels. And it's not the labels that they've internalized, but the labels society has offered them. 
So we are surrounded by labels. We give ourselves labels, and society gives us labels. And we accept them, right? We allow them to define who we are. Ready for this? We value our existence based on our labels. We value our existence based on our labels. Think about it. Think about it. We justify our worth based on the labels we accept about ourselves. And you may say, Pastor Todd, we're used to you being lighthearted and pithy and having fun in sermon. This, this sermon doesn't sound like it's going to be a whole lot of fun, and you're going to be right. But this sermon this morning is a message to a church that needs to hear it in a world that's becoming increasingly hostile to individuals. And when I say that, I mean they may say in the public one thing, but their activities say something very, very different. Our labels are being impressed upon us all the time. Think about it this way. When you watch television, when you watch television, you can watch television for 10 minutes before you're being forced, before before labels are being thrown at you that you didn't even realize you were. You want to be beautiful? This is what you need to have. You want to be happy? This is what you need to do. You want to have, be successful? This is a job you need to work. Meaning that when we're seeing that, it's implying that we are not those things. We are not successful. We're not beautiful. We're not strong. We're not physically fit, right? Right? I always tell people I am in good shape for my shape. Right? I am perfectly in shape for my shape. But the television says you're not healthy. You're not happy. People don't love you because you don't look a certain way. We define our value to the labels we accept about ourselves. And you're ready for this. We accept the negative labels in our lives. I was telling Larry at the first service, I said, if, 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 if he does a performance and 150 people come up to him and say, oh, man, that was amazing. Oh, man, that was fantastic. And that one person comes in and says, wow, that sucked. What's he going to take home? What's he doesn't remember? It defines the whole performance, right, Larry? It defines the whole performance because he's allowed a negative label to attach the, to be the value of his whole experience. And that's what I'm talking about here, church, is we have allowed the external and the internal authority where authority was never granted. And this is what we're going to get into, church. This is what we're going to get into. The issue with both of these are they are directly dependent on the activities outside of us and they are not the authority over us. The only one who has the authority to define your identity, to define who you are, is not you and it's not anyone around you, but who has given your identity is God your identity comes from God. Think about it this way. When you, when for, I, I did a study on new retirees. You know that suicide rates are the highest among newly retired people. Did you know that? And that being because they have spent the last 25, 30, 40, 50 years invested in a company, uh, a corporation, a job in which they have created relationships that they have, they have assumed was their identity. And when they, when they break away from that identity, they find themselves in a place where they are in a normlessness. They have no anchors of identity because it's all passed away. And that leads to depression. That leads to isolation. And of course, that leads to the ultimate thing, destruction, right? When we place value on the wrong things, it's 
easy to get lost. When we place value on the wrong things, it's easy to get lost. Maybe you're a person who thought, oh, 30 years ago, I could go up the steps fine. I could get in out of my car fine. 25 years ago, I could do this fine. I was quick. I was strong. And now life has aged you and matured you. And you find yourself at a point where you feel helpless and weak. You feel worthless. You feel like a burden. Anybody hear me this morning? Maybe you're a person who's middle-aged, who thought you'd have a different career, a different life, a different job that made so much money, but you find your, and you have a family, but you find yourself divorced, careerless. You find yourself alone with no circle. Maybe, maybe you had aspirations in high school. Maybe you, you dreamt of being part of a specific group on a specific team, doing a specific activity, and nothing ever worked out. Maybe you're going to take the world by storm, but right now you're just taking the store by storm behind the cash register at the local convenience store. And we've labeled ourselves failure, worthless, old, unlovable, broken, addicted, abused. And we accept these negative labels. Do you want to see a correlation between the acceptance of negative labels in our society and looking at the amount of uh, diagnoses of depression and mental illnesses? It's astounding. It's astounding. And it's in the church as well. It's not just in the world out there. It's in the church as well. That there are, are things that bombard us each and every day saying that you're not enough, you're not good enough, and you'll never make it because you're not so-and-so. And we compare our lives to other people, don't we? It's one thing I love about Facebook is Facebook is the filtered version of someone's life. Oh, look, they're on vacation again. Oh, look how happy they are. Oh, look, that, she's married. I thought I'd be married. It's Valentine's Day, folks. It's the worst and best day of the year for everybody, right? Because you see it online. You see it as the, as the single people are like, oh, where is my love? Where is my fulfillment? And we find ourselves saying, wow, wait a minute. What happened to me? And we sink into depression, anxiety. We sink into isolation. And we deal with things through addiction, self-harm. Self Abuse, lashing out. All because we've allowed something with no authority to have authority in our lives. You ready for this, church? We've allowed something with no authority to have authority in our lives. But here, I want to give you some truth. For the church, for us who are Christians, who believe in Jesus, the authority of the world is not the authority of over us. 
God's authority holds over us. God's authority is what we stand on. God's authority is what defines us. God's authority is what controls us. God's authority is what we have to cling to. It's God's word that defines us. And let's talk about what God's word defines you as. God says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Translation from Pastor Todd, you're amazing. You are wonderful. And you are awesome. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God tells Jeremiah and he tells the church, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. God knew you before you were born. God intentionally puts you together. God designed you. God has made you, and you are awesome. There's a world out there that doesn't want to tell you that because they need you to buy into the lies that you need something from them. They need you to buy into the lies because they need to be, have power over you. But the lies are lies for a reason. It's sometimes, a lot of times, most of the times, it's easier to believe a lie than it is a truth. Brian Jenkins probably would love that line right there. God has made you. God has spoken over you. God is intimately involved in your life. God has given us everything. Ephesians 2.19 tells us we are no longer strangers with God, but fellow citizens with the saints. We are part of the family of God, as 1 John tells us. 1 John 3 tells us you are God's children. You are God's children. We are part of the family of God. You have a father in heaven who just so happens to be the creator of all things. I don't know about you, but like, that's pretty cool, right? To understand that when God is with us and that God is for us, that God has given us everything, we are treasured by God for he has lavishly poured out his love on us. You are, have value and you have worth. You have this amazing gift Because God says, this is what I think, and this is what I did for you. This is what I think about you, and this is what I did for you. God says, you're not worthless, you're not unloved, you're not unvalued, because I love you, I gave everything for you, and you are worth everything to me. We are the prize of God's creation. Genesis chapter 2, the second creation story, tells us how God made us. God didn't speak us into existence. God didn't just will something to happen. But God stooped down to the earth and formed humankind in his image with his fingers and breathed into us his own breath, his breath of life. God lives and dwells inside of us as Jesus said tells us that when you proclaim Christ and you are baptized by the Holy Spirit, that God dwells within you, that a portion of you is divine. How is that worthless? How is that failure? How is that something to be ashamed of? You are sacred, treasured, and loved by God. Christ has given us life. Christ has given us life. Romans 5.10 tells us that Christ has reconciled us to God and to one another. That we're not alone. You are not alone. You are never alone. Because God has given us a family. His family and our church family. So as you find yourself where you're in a position where life is changing and you find yourself in a position where you're looking back at things and maybe you have some regrets because you didn't do it right the first time. Well, first off, get in line. None of us have done it right the first time. 
But when you're in a position where you're looking back on your life and you're looking forward and you're going, I don't know where my value is. I don't know where my where my worth is. Your worth isn't coming from what you can do or can't do. Your worth comes from God and Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit who has, who has designed you, who has claimed you, and who will uplift you to be his people, to live with him one day forever and ever. He will be our God And God will be with his people. That's you. God desires to live with you. God desires this more than anything. Divine value and purpose. God has the authority to give you your identity. God has the authority to tell you who you are. When we, are, when we are listening to the voices inside our heads and from the people outside of us saying, loser, broken, failure. When we're seeing things outside our world that says, helpless, weak, God says, no. God says, no. One of the things that I hear the most when I'm doing pastoral counseling with people or just sitting in and hearing their conversations, whether that person is five years old or 100 years old, I hear when someone says they talk about their shortcomings. I used to, but I can't now. I couldn't, so I won't. And we start beginning to use that as a crutch to lean on as to some sort of divine excuse to leave this world in a hurry. But let me tell you something. It's not about what you could do because if it was ever about what you could do, we never needed Jesus. Your life is valued. Your life is treasured. You are sacred and loved, not because of what you can do, but because God loves you. Your worth comes from something outside of yourself. It's because God has claimed you. So we get to say no to the lies. We get to say no to the claims that we're not enough. We get to say no to the claims that says you don't measure up because God has given us everything that we need. Hello, my name is. And that is my value. That is my worth. Hello, my name is. And so what do we do with that as a church? Well, we internalize that and we live it each and every day. Imagine what the world would look like. I believe that the diagnosis of depression and mental illness and the number of suicides would decrease drastically if we believed the truth of God's word rather than the lies we tell ourselves and the lies that the world wants us to hear. I believe that if we all woke up in the morning and said, I am a divine child of God, that I have hope and a future and that I am worth everything, I believe that we would be satisfied with whatever state our lives were in. I believe we find happiness and joy where we are rather than seeing where we are not. We wake up in the, in the morning and yes, maybe it takes you five and a half minutes to get out of bed. Guess what? You are a child of God. You don't get to lose that. You don't get to lose that. Whether you could do the things that you once did or you can't, God's value is in you. You are valuable. Your identity, when you get your little sticker, hello, my name is a child of God. Hello, my name is child of God. Say that with me. Hello, my name is child of God. Hit again. Hello, 
My name is child of God. Hello, my name is child of God. It's because of that title, folks. It's because of those words, folks, that we get out of the bed in the morning and we have joy in our hearts to sing because we have been claimed by God forever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And church, it's our job to go out into the world and to preach that message. To preach against the society that wants to uplift hurt. To preach against a society that wants to glorify that you are, are not enough. To preach against a society that is all too willing to point a finger and push others down. To preach against a society that wants to bring death and destruction because we are a church that preaches life and vitality because of who God is and what God has done in us. And that message is, is uh, extended to all those who will hear the gospel. Church, that's your mission. To go out and to share this message. To go out and live it so that others may see light. Hello, my name is a child of God. That movie, The Breakfast Club, it ends with, it ends with the characters writing a letter Refusing to be defined by the labels, but embraces their true nature. And saying, you know what? You don't get to tell me who I am because I know who I am. Amen and amen. Would you stand and join me as we recite our historic Apostles' Creed, our affirmation of faith, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you join me in our closing hymn? As you sing this hymn, be reminded of the joy that that sweet grace brings you and how that grace is offered to all people and that is offered to you and through you by the blood of Jesus. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now But now I see T'was grace that taught my heart to fear And grace my fears relieved How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangers toils and snares I have
like yours. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Yea, when this flesh I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shine. Son, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began. That grace, that grace is given to you to each and every one of you. And as you receive that grace, that is your worth. That is your value. That is your identity. That God loved you so much that he gave you everything. And he pours out over you that is who you are. Hello, my name is Child of God. Go now this day, knowing that God, the Father, the Son, and the blessed Holy Spirit be with you all, keeping you in his comfort and gaze, giving you strength and courage, giving you the gospel message in your hearts, that you may go out with praise and joy, that you may go out to share, that you may be that light because your worth will affect the worth of all. Amen.